I'd like to pass it off to our distinguished moderator, Michael Dorf, uh, attorney at law. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think what we'll do is just introduce ourselves briefly. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Michael Dorf. I'm a partner at Sherman and Sterling. Uh, I do a lot of work with both public and private companies, both um, buying them, selling them, and on the mergers and acquisition side, as well as a lot of venture capital work, uh, both for companies raising capital and for investors. Um, and like one of the previous uh, people who spoke, we are uh, friendly service and reasonable rates. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> relatively speaking. Uh, and so, uh, start with me, I'm David. Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Dave Rye. Um, I was most recently uh, an executive uh, at Informatica, which is an enterprise uh, software company. Uh, I ran their corporate development, so it was strategy, M&A, business development, uh, and investment. So I'll be able to give you a little bit of a perspective from a strategic acquirer. And uh, was there for, for eight years, and we saw, you know, during that time, the company grow from uh, 400 million to a little over a billion in revenue, and a good chunk of that was through acquiring companies similar to, to yours. So, um, anyway, look forward to the discussion. Hi, my name is Tammy Tompkins, and I've just wrapped up almost four years working in the venture capital world. I was at Coastal Ventures, um, just left five days ago, um, and uh, so I will. I'm an, I'm an attorney by training. I used to work with Michael. I used to work for Michael. Um, and uh, uh, so I will uh, try to speak to the, the investor perspective. Um, and Coastal is an early stage investor, so we invested in, and the firm still invests in companies, probably a lot like many of yours as well. Hi, my name is Al Longfield. I'm a, an investment banker with Roth Capital. Roth Capital is a full, full service investment bank, uh, about 200 folks, um, focused uh, largely on serving you know earlier stage growth companies. We do a lot of work with uh, early stage public companies as well. Uh, uh, about 100 transactions a year on average. I spend most of my time working with uh, you know fairly early stage and, and mid market companies. Uh, advising on uh, mergers and acquisitions as well as uh, capital raises. Great. Um, well, I think today's topic is um, selling a venture back company. Um, you know, I know the, the sign says idea to IPO, but we'll change that for tonight. We'll call it idea to sale instead, uh, which I think in, in many cases is probably the more likely outcome for, for a lot of companies, uh, particularly given how, how tough it is uh, going public and how, how subject that is to kind of market windows. Um, you know, for most people starting a company, you know, you're doing that besides the kind of you know love for the business and and whatever your technology is and you know, having a great solution to a problem. Uh, the other objective is typically to achieve some kind of exit uh, for yourself and for your investors, usually through a through a sale or an IPO. Um, can we uh, spend a little time chatting about um, some of the key considerations people would think about as you grow a company in terms of whether to um, focus on an IPO or or, or a sale and and you know how much of that when you're thinking about that is due to just what the company's doing versus um, you know external external factors like the market and what everybody else out there is doing well I, I can take a stab at that uh, obviously you know at any given point in time uh, markets you know play a tremendous role in as to whether or not there's really even capital out there for companies to, to get public <clears throat> certainly as um, yeah, after the financial crisis, it was very difficult, certainly for earlier stage companies, to um, get public. The Jobs Act has changed that, but still, I think most of the IPOs, at least that you see on the tech side, are tend to be what I would call, um, you know, fairly mature companies that have, you know, more sustainable business models than perhaps what you would see, you know, kind of in the early 2000s and the late 90s, and so market conditions. Um, you know, haven't been as kind to, you know, some of the earlier stage companies. But, but, you know, and we'll get into, I'm sure, discussion of this. But, um, you know, but, but in consideration to, to going public, I mean, there is, going public is, um, you know, a, a lot, it, it's an ideal objective for uh, a lot of folks, but, but the reality of being public is, is not so ideal uh, for many companies. And so I'm sure we'll have some discussions about that. So M&A is, is probably appropriate for, 95 plus percent of the companies that are out there ultimately. Um, yeah, look, so we look at a lot of companies, all of them start uh, 
I think really with the goal of they want to go public, but uh, I agree with Al. I mean, practically speaking, it's really challenging for a lot of different reasons, sometimes well beyond your control, whether it's market conditions. I do agree. I think market conditions have a big impact. Can you, you know, can you go out public? What What's involved in doing that? Um, and do, do you really want to do it? It's not, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of focus from investors. Being public is not necessarily the greatest thing. Every move is watched. Every time you, uh, you know, have a slip up, you're going to feel it. And um, sometimes uh, it's better to be part of a bigger organization where if you can do a lot of the same things but not face the same kind of scrutiny uh, that you might as a public company. So. Yeah, I guess um, the other, well, I'm curious, for those of you who are entrepreneurs and have either previously or currently started companies, how many of you are hoping for an IPO event? Well, interesting. Okay. How many of you are hoping for some sort of an acquisition or merger exit? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, another consideration um, in that regard is your employee base. You know, how do you keep with these companies that it's harder and harder, people have to, companies are staying private longer and longer, and how do you keep your employees motivated? Um, and that's very difficult. Oh, I'm not talking into the microphone. My comment was just how do you keep your employees motivated if you're going to stay private for a long time? Yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, we, we see that a lot with companies that are kind of are looking at both. Um, you know, besides the, the, the market window, I mean, the window has been shut for, you know, for a year, and I think now there's a lot of companies in the pipeline that are starting to go out, but it is so much more subject to what the market's doing. You know, the M&A market is also very market-driven, but it's usually not a question of whether you can get sold or not. It's really more a question of at what price and what terms, who your buyers are going to be, but you can generally, you know, almost always sell a company under any conditions. It's just a question of what the outcome is going to be. Um, so it's not quite as kind of binary as yes or no, uh, which is what happens a lot with IPOs. Um, you know, there's a lot of great reasons to go public. You, you know, management stays in control of the company. You've got, you know, currency you can use to, to um, do other acquisitions and, and, and you know, you've got a, a name out there that has a lot more recognition. It's a great way to grow the business, but, but I think what Dave said was right, was that, you know, you suddenly you're under the microscope of living with, you know, quarter to quarter, um, you know, investor demands and, you know, if you miss a quarter, it could be pretty catastrophic. Um, a lot of companies, I think most companies find that the, the more likely outcome is, is in fact, a sale. Um, you know, again, it's still driven by market factors, but, you know, you're, you know, you're, it's pretty clean. Typically, when you sell the company, you're done, you get paid at closing, as opposed to an IPO where, you know, you might get a great pop that day, but you can't sell for six months, and by the time you can't sell, frequently the price is lower than, uh, than, than what, uh, what it was when you went out. So, you know, you might have some very happy kind of paper millionaires or billionaires for a period of time, but that doesn't always happen when they, when they can finally sell. Um, what are some of the reasons for, uh, for, for people to, um, I'm going to turn this off because there's a lot of feedback. Uh, what are some of the reasons for um, founders to, to sell the company rather than continuing the business as far as you know, things like timing? Uh, and when would, you, you know, when would you advise people with, a, with an earlier stage company to think about, about an exit? Is it, is it um, typically better to kind of stay and hold on and grow the business as much as you can before you think about selling? Or should people think about you know, maybe taking their chips off the table earlier, earlier in the process? More than in the life of the company. Well, I, I, I think, I think um, you know, it, 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 it depends. I mean, there's so many different variables and factors that play into it. But, um, you know, valuation is one of those factors that people tend to care most about. And, you know, when you, when you look at valuation multiples, you've got a rapid, rapid growth profile that looks like it's going to stay out there for an extended period of time. The reality is that's when you're going to get the highest multiple. When it starts to flatten out, the multiple may may start to decrease. But the question is, you know, depending on what business you're in and what type of company profile and cash flow profile you are, you are um, a lower multiple may not be the worst worst outcome as well. Um, you know, because you may have a lower multiple against a higher metric, whatever that metric be, whether it's revenue or earnings or, or you know. EBITDA or, or something like that. And so, um, you know, I, I think it really is a function of what, what you're trying to achieve. But one of the things that we see often, which is a, you know, a good time, especially for a, what I would call still relatively early stage companies that are trying to make the leap to 
um, you know, kind of the next level of, of growth is that a lot of times the, the founders, the, the company makeup that was in place to, to, to go through kind of that, that rapid growth, um, those founders and, and sometimes the executive management team don't have the same skills to manage a mature business. And so that's a natural time to, to, to consider whether it's the right time to sell because to, to institutionalize some of the practices that you have to institutionalize to get to the next level of business growth is pretty challenging. And a lot of times, again, it requires you bringing in some skills perhaps that you don't have in your organization. And that often means making more investment, which means taking down the bottom line for a period of time to do it. And so a na that's a natural time to consider selling is when you kind of bump up against um, you know, kind of the, the normal barriers of, of skills that you have in your organization to take to take the growth to the next level. This comes out. Mm -hmm. Sure, this comes out. All right, maybe it does. Maybe it's like. That. Um, so I'd agree. I think that uh, uh, there are different levels, different uh, management teams are. Um, better at different stages. I think that's one thing to factor. I think the other thing is probably the, one of the biggest, um, I would say, mistakes I see entrepreneurs make is um, things are going really well and they think it's going to go to the moon. Um, frankly, not in, interested in engaging in a dialogue, um, but it's just never perfect. And I can tell you as a large company, a, being a large public company, even small companies, um, companies do hit roadblocks could be management, it could be something that's going on industry-wise, could be the economy. And so I think you always have to be open. You know, you may have a certain goal, but also be open and um, recognize that, yeah, things look great now, um, but it may not always be like that for reasons that may or may not be under your control. So. Yeah, and uh, one of those uh, reasons could be uh, loss of confidence or faith by your investors. Um, and or even if they still have sort of the faith and the belief in the company, they may have their own internal fund issues that they're trying to manage. They may be just the fund that's invested in your company may just be out of cash. There's nothing left in the, in, in the reserves to keep funding the company. Um, another thing that sadly happens sometimes is there's friction between investors who tend to share board seats and their, you know, their co-investors slash shareholders and they sit on the board and they have very different views about where the company should go, what the company's prospects are, the quality of the management team. There's a whole array of issues they can uh, differ on, and sometimes that can be a nasty food fight that is utterly out of your control, and uh, they can't agree. They may try to force a sale. Uh, so one of the pieces of advice I give entrepreneurs, for sure, is to really understand what controls your investors have. You need to understand those documents where all that stuff is written up and really understand what they can block, what they can force, and what you've managed to keep control of in terms of your own destiny. Generally, you give up some, sometimes a lot of control to take that money, and uh, you know that sometimes comes at a price beyond just cash. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, there's definitely kind of a risk-return trade-off, but there's so much risk from you know having a concept and and a you know early-stage company to scaling up to even becoming you know maybe a unicorn or a late-stage pre-IPO company. Um, and, and while there's certainly a significantly higher value at that later stage, a lot of companies that are very, very promising don't, don't necessarily make it there. Um, one of the interesting things is that, you know, you're going to grow, you're probably going to raise additional capital. Typically, investors, when they put money in, they're going to have a preference and they're going to get paid out first anyway. So even if your value is going up, you've got to be going, you know, growing significantly greater than the rate at which you're bringing money in uh, because while your value, you know, you might be able to sell for more, you, you know, you might be having to split the pieces up and share your proceeds with with a larger investor base. So, you know, sometimes founders tend to even clear more um, selling at an early stage before before you've got to start sharing money with with investors and preferences. Um, one of the things we see is that when companies do sell at an early stage, a lot of the value actually is more back end loaded, and it's tied sometimes to continued employment because um, a lot of the talent really is then the people as opposed to a revenue stream. Um, so, you know, you do need to if you're going to sell early, you got to make sure you've got a very good partner where you're going to, you know, a home that you're going to keep your business in for a while because you probably will need to spend some time um, sticking around in order to, in order to fully invest and realize, realize full value. A lot of those are more, more talent driven than, 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 uh, than, than revenue driven. Um, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting is, you know, not just what happens with your company, 
but what's happening in the market and what your competitors are doing. Um, sometimes, you know, one company gets bought and suddenly it creates a kind of a feeding frenzy in that space, and suddenly other people start getting bought too, um, which which you know makes you a little more valuable. Um, sometimes we were working with one company where, you know, unfortunately it was kind of a game of musical chairs where Yahoo bought one of their competitors and then Adobe bought a competitor and then IBM bought a competitor, and then I think someone else bought one and then Google built built the same thing in house and suddenly these guys were, you know, the last people standing, but everybody had one of whatever it was they did. So you do need to sometimes be a little bit worried about you know. Being, being the the odd man out if if uh, if all your competitors get bought, but you know it's certainly a lot of a lot of timing uh, that goes into it as well. Um, question, Tammy, for you is um, you know as as a VC, how do you typically you know you mentioned kind of disputes with you know investors having a different thought process or timing, you know as as a VC, how do you make that decision to sell a portfolio company, and typically what role does does the investor play in that sale decision? So it can take a variety of forms. Um, I alluded to a couple of them. Sometimes you just uh, you've lost faith in the company for, for whatever reason. The you know the macro economy's shifted under its feet. The technology didn't pan out. Um, and the earlier the, the the stage of investment when a when an investor comes in, the more likely these things are to happen because there's a lot of unknowns many times. Um, uh, they couldn't figure out their go-to-market strategy. They they if you're watching the coffers, this shouldn't happen, but they spent recklessly, they're out of cash. Um, just these are different hypotheticals that can happen. Um, and, uh, or, or you just, the, the management team hasn't proven to be up to the task. Um, and so uh, sometimes the decision is sort of just to pull the plug. Like we funded it long enough, um, we just don't have the faith, we don't have the conviction that this particular team or this technology or this business plan can kind of get to the next level. and. We're not going to throw good money after bad, um, and it's time to just sort of put it on the auction block. And that decision is um, uh, is a is a very painful decision for the company, obviously. Uh, and then it becomes a matter of what does that process looks like, look like. And there's lots of different ways to sell companies. Uh, the one you'd never want to be in is the fire sale. Um, that's really generally a bad outcome for everybody. Um, so you know that's kind of the, I guess that's the. You know the, the the sad scenario. Another is that you you sort of see an opportunity for a company to be to be swallowed up by something bigger, and the technology and most of the team hopefully will live on uh, and have a platform for whether it's you know going into markets the company couldn't have access or just putting some sort of a manufacturing engine behind an embryonic kind of R and D technology that the company couldn't otherwise raise the money to do themselves. So there's synergistic opportunities to sell as well. Um, and sometimes, you know, the investors and the management team are aligned in those, and sometimes not, because I, I, th I fundamentally think most entrepreneurs are dreamers. Um, that's what this Silicon Valley is made of, and people start companies because they have a passion and a conviction about something, and they really want to grow. It's like having a child. Everybody wants their kid to go to. I think most people want their kids to go to college and, you know, go live fruitful, long lives, and it's hard to part with that dream. Um, but you know, if you can find a good home for your team and your technology and and you know everyone can live to fight a bigger uh, you know more and bigger days that's not a bad outcome um, and not going public is not a failure I think a lot of people get started and they think if it's IPO or bust and I would say quite the opposite but um, and uh, so I mean I guess those are sort of the ranges you know there's sort of the the, the, the the sort of you know downside it didn't work out and then there's the here's a great opportunity to uh, exit and then there's the messy Investors can't get along, kind of things in between that. So. Right, we're going to shift gears a little bit and move from the kind of you know why and when do you sell to getting a little more into the weeds on kind of sale process and, and evaluation and things like that. Um, you know, one of the things to think about um, you know as a founder is what what things you can do before you actually even launch a sale process to try to kind of dress the company up uh, for sale and try to you know make that as smooth process as possible since there are so many potential speed bumps uh, along the way. Um, I'll start this one and um, you know one of the things that's really important is to do really good due diligence on yourself. Um, any buyer is going to put you through a very rigorous uh, exam uh, and kind of you know, whatever bones you have in the closet they're going to find. Uh, and usually it's better for you to find it yourself um, before they find it because you'll have you know you can maybe have a solution you maybe you can fix it um, rather than them showing up you know two days before you're going to sign a deal and say we're repricing and 
taking this much off the price because of X, Y, and Z. So to the extent you can find that beforehand, um, that's great. I mean, there are things, you know, for example, you want to take a real good look at your capital structure, um, your capital table. You want to make sure that, you know, um, everything's documented, everything's approved. Uh, for example, if the board didn't approve stock option grants, there are bad tax consequences there. So, you know, make sure everything's been approved and get that cleaned up. Um, you know, you want to make sure you didn't give people, you know, 10 different people, 20% of the company. Um, that could be a problem. Uh, so you want to clear that up to the extent you can. It's always better, by the way, if you are carving up equity in the company to do it in terms of a set number of shares, not a percentage, um, so you don't have a producer's-like problem. Um, but that's the kind of stuff, if you know, if you found things like that, you can probably go back to people and fix it um, in advance. Um, so all that you know, internal diligence is helpful. It does you know, cost a little money and take in, you know, spend some time, but it's always better to do that beforehand because uh, it's going to cost you a lot more to fix it later. Similarly, um, you really want to scrub your balance sheet. Um, a lot of buyers, particularly private equity buyers, are going to, you know, they may structure their deal where there are various price adjustments based on, on your balance sheet and your work capital. And they will probably know your balance sheet better than you will by the time they're done with the process. Um, and so you want to, you know, to avoid surprises. Again, the better the handle you have on your own finances, the more likely you are to avoid kind of paying for it later um, at, the, at the end of the process. So, um, you know, my, my two cents are always, you know, the more you know about yourself, your business, your legal documents, your capital structure, your finances, before you invite someone else in to take a close look at it, you know, the better off you are in the process. And I would just make a plug for doing that you know, out of the gate, just to have a company that's been done right from day one. A lot of people, uh, and, and I get this, but a lot of people don't want to hire expensive lawyers. They think, you know, it's sort of the Y Combinator world and you can find all this stuff online and you can do it yourself and you can save a lot of money. And I think it is good to be very prudent and careful with your cash, but to do it sort of, uh, you know, penny wise, pound foolish, sort of, um, it is... I mean, the, the problems you can create that will literally cost sometimes, you know, millions of dollars to fix later and or crater what could have been a fabulous uh, acquisition opportunity, it's just not worth it. You can, you can find good counsel and you can, you can manage them. And you can manage the cost by managing your lawyers don't, don't, and, and accountants and the other folks in the ecosystem, but I would, don't try to do it yourself. It's not a good idea. Exactly. Can you be more specific? Your legal documents, your stock option plan, your managing your sort of your cap table, all that kind of stuff. Particularly, there can be some really big problems created if you don't sort of dot I's and cross T's with stock option grants. Very painful consequences. Um, I mean, just sort of not dotting I's and crossing T's with sort of administrative m matters that are primarily legal or corporate in nature. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a, you know, I think that's true of, you know, certainly of your corporate documentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll look at it more maybe from the financial side. I mean, knowing yourself and, and how your company's performing from a financial perspective, I mean, to, to Michael's point, I, I mean, I can't tell you more often than I care to remember how many times, you know, that you know, you end up finding something even in the pre process of preparation that you're thankful that you found it in the process of preparation because that gives you an opportunity. Every company has got dirty laundry. I mean, every there's there's nothing that's perfect, um, but it gives you an opportunity to prepare to position the dirty laundry as you know maybe it's not that dirty as opposed to being surprised by it in the diligence process where um, you know you've changed the, the the frame of reference from being on the offensive to being on the defensive and once you go on the defensive it's hard to get off the defensive um, and so it's 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 um, it's it's really um, it's really important I think the other thing from a positioning standpoint is you know going through a if you're going through going to go through an organized and, you know, kind of a structured sell side process, um, it takes time. I mean, it, you know, these processes, you know, you know, done right, I mean, it takes several months um, to, to go through it from the preparation to the close. It takes several months. And, and during that time, there's a lot of things that also can go wrong. And so be realistic. I would say, you know, it's be realistic about your you know, you know, kind of your financial prospects, because the reality is by the time you put out perhaps a set of documents or set of projections to the time you actually close the process, time will have passed. Maybe it's a couple quarters. And if you have this hockey stick in there that's not realistic and wasn't going to be realistic, again, you've kind of put yourself on the defensive as opposed to the offensive. So 
uh, just add, Al made a good point. Um, so as a buyer, when you start finding lots of things in diligence, you really get spooked. And so uh, th then you start questioning everything you get, what else is hiding, waiting, hidden, slows the process down, you start maybe looking at price adjustments or even backing out. So try to be as clean as possible. You know, some of the areas that continue to come up, I mean, I think there's the old making sure the cap table and financials are clean. Some areas that surprisingly continue to come up even with professional investors are um, make sure your IP is clean. Uh, we've run into a lot of situations, particularly where you outsource development, uh, where other countries, folks have touched the code, but not necessarily have had it assigned to the company. So make sure, and again, this is from a software perspective, but anybody who's touched that code, it's got to belong, you know, consultant overseas. I cannot tell you how many times that will kill a deal and just stop it. Um, other things, because again, with uh, opening up development centers outside of the U.S., employment laws, just make sure you're in compliance with employment laws in other countries. I cannot tell you how much it comes up that either benefits aren't proper or we're not you know, paying people properly or you're paying below certain minimum wages. That comes up a lot. And then the other is taxes. And, you know, while overall you may be losing money and not necessarily paying federal tax, there's still a lot of jurisdiction or state taxes. And um, uh, when you sell products, there are, you know, even within the U.S., you've got to collect state tax or at least make sure that your um, customer is collecting state tax. So um, those continually come up, always, always come up. So, again, try to be as clean as possible. As things can, you know, more and more things come up, buyers start getting really spooked. What do you mean by assignment of code? Is that same as assignment of patents? Or? Well, um, basically anybody who touches the code, rather than that being the property of the individual's property of the company. How do they physically do that assignment? When I outsource it to somebody in China or India, they write code. They send it to us. Isn't that sufficient, or they need to write it? Well, they but legally, they sign an agreement saying everything we t it's still property of the company. So not specifically to that code every time, but in general. Anybody you hire to do code, it should all be you're the ultimate owner of the finished product. Okay, because the issue that we would run into again as a public company is we buy it, someone else says, this is actually our code, not your code. That's like a, you know, the worst thing. And particularly, it's usually sloppy and done offshore. You know, there's lots of different consultants or an offshore uh, firm that does development, and they don't necessarily have agreements in place saying, yeah, that even though I'm working on the code, it still belongs to the company. So the, I think the short answer is a legal agreement. You need a legal agreement with everyone who's going to touch your code or whatever your IP might be that says, yes, I'm getting paid by you and I'm creating. You own it. You company own it. Whatever I do, you own. I, by virtue of this magical legal agreement, I give all rights to you. Same with, cons you know, and it's even worse like in the U.S. You have some guy who comes in, you're doing a little help. Well, guess what? All these guys come out of the woodwork when there's an exit event saying, hey, I worked on this, I actually am a part owner. So, I mean, you gotta be just buttoned up and clean on that. Okay. So, yeah, another um, example are former um, founders. Sometimes, sadly, people found a company together and then there's friction and uh, they split ways. You've got to make sure that you get all the rights assigned from any departing founder uh, or, or early employee for that matter. You know, your buddy helped out, did, did some stuff on the side for you while you're trying to get your company started. You have to have all of that documented as he said, incredibly cleanly. The other thing I think David mentioned was on the employment stuff, and that's that's definitely a big issue when you get bought by a public company. So many startups are focused on you know not having employees and all the liability that comes with employees. So everybody's a contractor, um, and yeah, it's how what everybody does. But with the, you know public companies get very focused on you know some of the wage and hour rules and, and the class proper classification of employees and contractors. And when they buy you, it turns out that they will, and they will look at that if, if they think that the people you call contractors, they call employees, you know, you're going to be picking up a lot of those costs. And so you might be saving things on the front end. You'll be paying for it later uh, if you get bought by a, by a public company that focuses a little more closely on, on some of those issues. So it's avoiding a lot of those shortcuts that save you money when you're private. you got to think about how that's going to you know, cost you later when you're bought by a company that doesn't take those shortcuts. Um, so just moving on to the next topic, when you know 
when a company is raising venture capital before they before they do get sold or go public, are there things that people should be thinking about as part of the capital raising process? And Tammy, you've mentioned things like avoiding blocking rights and veto rights so that no individual class of investors can block a sale. But are there things that people can either see to be doing or, or avoiding as part of a uh, sale process, a uh, uh, capital raising process that can, puts them in the optimal position later for a, for a sale? So I guess I, um, these are my personal opinions. They're not reflective of my recent former employer. Um, I, I think um, it's really optimal if you have two, uh, two investors who basically hold equal power as opposed to one dominant or, you know, 20 little guys. Um, or sometimes you can have three co-investors that have equal power. I think that, and, and particularly if they complement each other in one way or another, in some industries people are so niche that you're, you know, you're going to, you're only going to have a, the 10 or 20 usual suspect firms to choose from. But if, particularly if you have a technology that's sort of broadly applicable, if you could find, you know, a, a firm that sort of tends to play in one sandbox and another that plays in another, but they kind of overlap, I think you get, um, you get better balance, you get better advice, you get, um, uh, you know, ideally, you know, better support, um, and, and you're not kind of at the, um, the mercy or whim of one, uh, you know, firm or board member who's bandwidth constrained and really doesn't have time to prop pay proper attention. Um, and then, you know, and that doesn't always work out that way. And, if you get a good term sheet, you need money, you'll take your term sheet. But really, really understand what rights you were given away when you sign that term sheet, well, when you sign your documents. Um, I, was, I just spent two hours today with a company that I'm just kind of helping um, and, and, you know, shocked me. These are very smart people who've been working in the Valley for 20 years and they didn't understand that they had given their lead investor a blocking right over any future financings, any M&A transaction. I mean, they were literally shocked. This is right before I drove down here, and I know, I mean, you've got to understand what you've um, signed up for, taking that money. And I, I unfortunately have a very recent horror story about that where an investor uh, put some money into a company, actually a very fairly small amount of money for the size of, of this company, had a blocking right, and, um, you know... <coughs> made the process very difficult throughout because of this blocking right and ultimately the deal cratered you know for for other reasons but it was largely related to the fact that this investor had made the process so difficult um, and and the thing that that's that's important about the blocking rights is um, you know, your your investor at, at the time of sale may have very different objectives from you and so you think that you're, you're aligned, and you may be aligned in growing the company for a period of time, but when it comes time for a transaction, the investor may have you know, a different incentive. Um, and, and, and obviously, they're looking to maximize their piece, and they're, they're, they're not necessarily thinking about perhaps the whole pie, which may include you know, future compensation related you know, to, to, to you know, your earnings or your employees' earnings or, or you know, kind of the, the long-term vision for the company. The investor's looking out for them at that point in time, so it's a really important issue. Just to add, some of the topics, so we see when we buy companies, we would see a lot of fairly dysfunctional situations, and um, look, sometimes when you raise money, you don't have a lot of choice in the investors. However, I think a couple things just to add on uh, to Tammy, I, it's if you have a choice in investors, um, find out what they've done in the past with sale, how they've behaved. You can easily find out past um, entrepreneurs and how that's how that has worked out. Um, to see if the, all the firms that are going to be part of your syndicate, if they've worked together before. I've seen situations where just two firms absolutely hate each other. Um, so forget about even an exit, but just managing that, you know, going forward. Um, the other thing is, um, and again, you may not always have control over it, but is understand the life cycle of the various funds uh, that are putting money in. Because uh, again, I, I've seen a number of situations where one fund is near the end; they need to get need to get out. Another, they have room; they would love to stay in. It just causes a lot of dysfunction. So again, you may not have a choice often, but if you know you're uh, in a competitive situation and you can choose among investors, these are some other factors I think to try to keep in mind. One last, one last thing here. Um, 
is, um, you know, I think I think the the non lawyers covered the legal points very well, so I'll cover a non legal point. Is that you know is don't just look at venture funds, also look at corporate investors. They become a lot more active um, in in the investing process as well. And you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you had took money from a corporate investor, they would usually have a lot of strings on it and rights to buy the company and a lot of other things that would really tie you up. And you had to really choose your partner very carefully. Um, I think that market has loosened up a lot now, and now you'll frequently see um, companies raising money from multiple corporate investors. It's a good way for companies to get to know you um, early on before they buy you. You're kind of an acquisition candidate for them. Um, you tend to be a closer business relationship with them because they're invested in your company as well. Um, the thing to be careful though is again make sure they don't have tight strings on the company, you know, first refusal rights or, or, or options on the company. A lot of corporate investors really now are okay with other corporates in, in, in your investor base and frequently just want, you know, the right a notification right. So if you are going to start a process, you got to at least call them and invite them to the party, even if they don't have any other kind of preferences. Um, so that's, you know, as far as looking at who, who's, you know, where your money's going to come from, that's always uh, make sure you cast your net wide enough to pick up some of the, some of the corporates that they, they'd be pretty helpful. As, as Dave knows, having having been one, right? Um, you know. Michael, are you guys taking questions now, or should we hold it? We take questions now. After. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Al, um, you know, one one question for you is, you know, what you know, I know, public companies will always see an investment banker and a fairness opinion, and you know, very banker driven process. But with you know, particularly with early stage private companies, what role does does an investment banker typically play um, in the in the uh, M and A process? Sure. So if if you know you've made a decision for for whatever reason that it's time time to 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 sell the company, um, you know, it's advisable to to run an organized process. And the best a lot, a lot of, a lot of we, we do run into a lot of companies that at some point have decided, well, we're going to save some money and we're going to try to run this process on our by ourselves. And those situations are usually you know situations, unfortunately, where it's probably too far gone where we could even be helpful. Um, often is the case. But uh, what what a, what a what a banker can do and and can help with is to to really help uh, prepare not only prepare the company to be sold in terms of what is the package that we want to present in terms of diligence, in terms of uh, you know positioning, in terms of um, you know the 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 whole the whole package and, and presentation to to you know potential buyers, but 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 the banker is going to go out and run a, a process, and that process can vary quite significantly for for different companies. But but uh, you know often is the case where we're we're running fairly full blown auctions where we're contacting you know dozens and perhaps many dozen you know prospective buyers either strategic or, or private equity buyers and that 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 process in and of itself is very helpful for price discovery um, because one of the things you always want to want to do in, in these types of processes is make sure you're getting the best set of terms price is a very important term but there are other terms as well that are very important um, and in hiring a banker you can feel pretty confident that if that banker's done their job that by the end of the process whatever the outcome is that you have fully explored what the market is um, for for your company and for the opportunity and you know feel feel pretty good that what, whatever the outcome was that at least that you you know you've you you've done a diligent process and that outcome was the best outcome that was available at the time and that's that in a nutshell is what what a banker can do a lot of times where we see companies run into problem is problems is that they may get approached by one party and and then they have an extended dialogue with with that party and then maybe have string along a couple of other dialogues with other parties and then you know we often get the call that says well the deal is basically done um, and what you find out is not only is the deal deal basically done but the way you've you know kind of presented to these companies is you've you've made yourself very vulnerable, um, and it's very difficult for a banker to to come in and, and fix um, you know a, a set of dialogues that have already been prepositioned, um, you know, in in a manner that's not necessarily favorable for the company. Yeah, that's always a uh, you know a interesting discussion early on is do you do you run a full you know, full auction, talk to as many people as you possibly can, which has, you know, you know, is great for, you know, getting a lot of interest and maximizing price, but there's always the risk that, you know, you invite a party and nobody shows up and that can be damaging to the company. It also means that, you know, you've 
it's hard to keep things confidential, even with confidentiality, confidentiality agreements, which can be disruptive. I think in a lot of industries, there are, particularly if you're not looking at private equity um, buyers, there may only be two or three likely buyers, in which case, you know, there might not be as much value in an auction, and then it really is just trying to manage That's right. two or three likely buyers. Um, but again, a lot of it's dependent really on kind of your company, your industry, what the dynamics are, and who the likely buyers, who the likely buyers are. But one, one more thing just to say about that is what, 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 whatever the whatever the industry, and I completely agree with that because I mean, a, a, you know, an auction people think of as broad, but I mean it could be a very targeted or limited scope auction. Um, but you want it when you, when you're ready to go, you want to you want to do that simultaneously and kind of have everybody at the same stage as much as can be at the same time because um, you know that's when when you get somebody who's so far ahead of the other party, it's very hard to kind of walk it back. Um, at the risk of potentially losing, you know, maybe what 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 is the best offer, or um, for you know, bird in the hand versus a bird in the bush, and that's always a problem. So again, a part of a banker's job is to try to kind of line that up to make sure all those dialogues are happening, you know, simultaneously. And so whenever, you know, there is a decision to you know kind of pull the trigger with one 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 buyer or another, that um, you know, even if it's two or three buyers, you know. You, f you feel pretty, pretty confident that you've vetted that those two or three buyers to the best you can. And Al, probably worth mentioning that there are different kind of flavors of bankers, right? There's Absolutely. there's everything from Goldman Sachs to you know firms you guys wouldn't have heard of um, who can run you know they're small lean shops. They specialize in very sort of small deals and they'll work very cost efficiently and still get you to a much better process. Very much like what Al described. And moving from kind of the banking side to the to the buyer to the, to the, the buyer side, um, Dave is a you know, corporate development professional. What do you typically look for in an acquisition candidate, and how do you you know you're probably looking at you know hundreds of companies a year. How do you kind of run your internal process to decide you know who the most viable candidates are? Well, so typically, for us, there were kind of two types of acquisitions. There were uh, kind of technology roadmap acquisitions, and then there were uh, you know revenue accretion acquisitions with really the latter being the most exciting um, so I think it, you know if it was a technology acquisition it, it was a matter of look we have a gap in our roadmap relative to um, competitors we need to fill that do we buy it or do we build it internally and stuff's moving so fast that we decided it's something we'll, we'll buy um, but again those if that's all it was was a technology deal uh, we're not going to spend a lot of money for those deals, um, but uh, that, that'd be one, sort of one category. Then the other would be um, you know, category uh, companies that can add revenue, and again, when you reach a certain scale as a public company, you know, the market wants growth. They want revenue growth, so you're trying to look for what are various ways. There's organic growth, and then there's also inorganic growth, and so we're, what we tended to look for were companies that our bigger distribution network could sell, our current sales force could sell. You know, and does it slot in and fit? So is this something our current sales force of 250 direct sales guys versus maybe say eight at a private company, but can these 250 uh, sales guys absorb knowledge of the product, get out and sell it? Because if, if it can, if you can do that, it's a beautiful thing. And it, I mean, these uh, acquisitions, you know, you can, do 5x, you know, we've had situations you do 5x the amount of sales within, you know, two years relative to what the company was doing standalone. So um, I'd say I'd break it, simplify it. Those are kind of two, two things that we look at. Then, you know, the other factors are, you know, are employees going to stay? Are they going to leave? How, do, how is the fit culturally? What's, you know, what's driving them? Those are all factors. If we think that uh, Founders and other key employees are likely to leave. That's that's a big red flag for us because uh, again, typically we're trying to acquire the talent uh, as well. Uh, you know, not just not just the technology. So, um, you know, in terms of internal processes, um, again, it depends on the size of the deal. But I'd say at a high level, um, just getting support amongst multiple constituencies. So we'd have support from the product side as well as support from the sales side. Um, that was pretty critical for us to get a deal done, and then obviously it would be a matter of the deal and getting approval, um, usually from our board. So that's one of the things you can think about as you're talking to corporate buyers is what is, just as if you're 
in a sale process for your product? What is you know, what are the um, steps you need to go through on your side? What are the various approvals? Who needs to needs buy-in? Similar kind of thing. So, you know, as a, as a seller, um, you know, going through a process is a lot of things that um, are important. Not just not necessarily just price. Um, you know, one of the things we find typically is that you know, if, you're, if a seller is comparing a lot of bids, sometimes you don't necessarily chase chase the highest price out there um, for a number of reasons. One can be just more of a tactical issue of you know, people doing diligence may come in and bid with different levels of knowledge about the company. Um, sometimes the person bidding the most may not be the smartest about your company, and you've got to assume that at some point they're going to get smart. They may not have just they be, may not have put in as many resources early in the process. Um, and so but you got to figure at some point, you know, some people just throw in a high number to get you to talk to them exclusively and then they'll lower their number once they learn more about the company. So, you know, knowing yourself sometimes helps, know, you know, really, really evaluate whether bids are realistic or not. Um, but in addition to that, it is very important, and I think people kind of touched on this before, of really doing diligence. You know, the buyer's going to do diligence on the seller. You've got to do diligence on the buyer as well because... You know, particularly if they're acquiring the talent and they're not just looking for you for the revenue, um, you want to make sure that that's going to be a good fit for your business. That's going to be a good opportunity for you to grow. They're going to provide the resources uh, for you to scale the business and hopefully have some level of level of control. Um, and a lot of these are things that aren't necessarily addressed in an agreement per se. People aren't going to write all this stuff down, but um, just talking to the buyers and really getting a good relationship with them, making sure it's a good fit. Um, you know, it's pretty important. Um, you know, you, you can also talk to other people who have sold their their businesses to buyers. I mean, buyers have reputations in the market um, in terms of, you know, what it's like to work for them going forward, how much autonomy to give to the team, uh, do they actually close their transactions. Um, you know, culture is very important, particularly if it's a foreign buyer. Um, but does, you know, the, the folks on the panel have any other thoughts in terms of, you know, as a seller, evaluating to the buyer, what kind of questions they should be asking? Uh, here, I'll just, yeah, I, I can add a little bit because we, we um, yeah, I mean, look, I would ask the various buyers, uh, you know, what's the percent of deals that from term sheet to then actually close? How much do, uh, does price or other key terms change between, you know, and as Michael said, um, frequent practices get thrown a real high price, get you an exclusivity, and next thing you know, uh, the price drops toward the end and so especially if you're in a competitive situation you know even though one party may have a slightly lower price if they have a higher probability that a deal gets done um, you know that's that's definitely a factor uh, factor to consider as far as you know post acquisition um, you know it's really easy to find other companies that a strategic spot and talk to the uh, entrepreneurs and execs you know did they stay? What were the roles afterward? Were they given the resources? Um, you know, a lot of that's just diligence you need, you can do um, outside of the process. But, uh, you know, companies tend to uh, get reputations, um, bad or good, in terms of, you know, are they a friendly acquirer? Do they tend to take most employees, try to do everything they can to keep them? Uh, or they tend to be more just acquire for technology and uh, customer base. So, but these are all things that you can, you know, you can definitely do work on. So, I think we're at the uh, Q and A time. If people have any questions, we're here to kind of answer pretty much anything uh, from uh, baseball to selling your company to anything in between. <laughs> um, do we? Do we? Pick? Oh, okay. Well, I've got, yeah, I think you were first before, so yeah, you're supposed to. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The podium? Okay. Okay. You're going to be on YouTube tonight. Yeah, I'm yeah. famous. Oh, this is great. Well, this question is for Tammy. That situation they were talking about, the kind of the entrepreneurs and the situation that they got themselves into because they didn't have their ducks in a row. I was a little bit confused as to didn't they have attorney representation? with the term sheet and why they would end up in that situation and how we could avoid that situation? So um, I probably would, from what I've seen, I would put this company and, and this set of founders in the bucket of um, they were trying to do a lot themselves. Um, and I think that the longer you've been around, the more tempting it probably is because you sort of feel like you've, you sort of get it and you don't need to spend a bunch of money on expensive lawyers. Um, and 
you know, I, I think they were just a little naive in that respect. And I think, you know, broad strokes, they, they understood things, but they didn't really understand some of the devil in the detail. Um, you know, there's, the, there's a particular set of provisions that they're usually buried in your articles of incorporation, your charter, certificate of incorporation, whatever your founding document is. And it's that gobbledygook, god-awful legal stuff that everybody sort of just, you know, and, and, and that's where the gotchas tend to be. Um, and I think that, uh, and, 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 I, and I think the other thing I've seen, um, and might have been true a bit in this situation, is, uh, you know, a little bit of probably healthy, but a little paranoia, sort of not wanting to let anybody in the kind of in the inner circle, sort of wanting to do it, do it yourself and, and sort of being unclear about who you can trust. Um, and honestly, if, if, you know, in a situation like that, if, if the founders can spend a couple of hours interviewing law firms, find one that's highly regarded, highly recommended, develop a relationship, and then just figure out how to manage that law firm's time or that, well, it doesn't have to be a law firm. You know, there are great sole practitioners who are, are very well trained and they've hung their own shingle. You know, spend whatever, two, three, four, five thousand dollars up front. And a lot of the other issues that have been pointed out, the labor and employment law issues, the tax stuff, I mean, you can you can play offense on a lot of that stuff. You can architect it properly up front and then just have touch in points with, with your counsel as you go and you'll avoid a lot of because they'll help they'll help you issue spot. They'll help you figure out what does it mean. And um, it's it's sad. So I guess I don't know, I guess what I'm saying is trust the lawyers out. <laughs> a little self serving maybe, I don't know. <laughs> So um, my question also relates to the lawyer and legal service. So uh, could you explain the impact of the IP, how to protect the IP, like how much money a startup need to spend to be a good like a company uh, for the seller? I think there's, I think there's really kind of two things there. One is um, just making sure that you own everything. And that's you know, really just having a standard form of agreement, an invention assignment agreement. Making, which lawyers right, yeah, which, which, and, and that's making, and again, better to do that than have one that's just pulled off the internet that may or may not work. Um, and, and make sure that everybody that does work for the company, employee, contractor, consultant, signs one. Um, and if someone's using a subcontractor, make sure the subcontractor signs one um, as well so that you've got a good chain of title and say, show that everybody can touch the code. And that's not just the code. It's, I mean, I think even, you know, even, you know, your, your um, people in marketing and sales, I mean, really throughout the company should be signing these things. Whatever they do um, should be yours. The company's not theirs, and you want to avoid any claim to that. The other thing that, that you need to do, um, which is probably a more expensive process, is make a decision of whether to patent things or not. But that's, that's an entirely kind of different discussion. But um, that's the other kind of IP piece that people focus on or not. Or, or not. And that's, again, very industry-specific. But in a minimum, you really just want to make sure everybody signs an assignment contract with the company. And keep it in the file, too. Having it and losing it doesn't help you. So keep it in a folder, keep it in paper, keep it electronic, accessible, kind of by person, so you can present it to your buyer, because they're going to make you, you know, you know show it in diligence. You're going to have representations in your agreement. And this is also raising capital, too, because your investors are going to have you make representations also that says everybody that touched the code signed an invention assignment agreement. Um, you got to show them the form. And frequently, if, if you don't have it signed by people, they'll make it track them down later. So, you know, having good records on that and being, you know, being really strict about it is, is very important. Yep. 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 Um, two questions. Um, whether the documents and the signatures have to be in electronic form or should we have some of them in the paper form? First question. Second question is could you tell more about trademark, copyright, patent, etc.? Yeah, um, on the first one, I think it's. Um, I, didn't, I didn't catch the second one, so that'd be first. Um, the first question was um, is it okay to have all these uh, uh, employee agreements, the IP, in the electronic form, especially because some of my developers are back in India? Um, what I do is I send them, uh, they print it out, sign it, and then send me the scanned copy. Is that sufficient, or should I insist that, okay, I have this original somewhere in the paper form? Yeah, I mean, I think usually as long as the agreement, and again, it's probably different in each jurisdiction, I don't know what it is in India, but normally, you know, 
says that you can have PDF copies, and most agreements say that. As long as it actually says that, you know, you're fine. And I think that's what most. And we have this it. nowadays: is a CUDA sign, yeah. the DocuSign, they are okay. Yeah, they typically they're, typically, they're usually set up. That they're they're okay. I think a lot of companies do that. So, I think first in the back, you kept getting up and <laughs> always getting beaten to the podium. <laughs> My second question was related to when to file the trademark, copyright, and patent. And how much should we be spending on those? Let's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> We've got other trademark people, and I don't really do that, so I don't, I don't really know. But I'm um, you know, just any insight. I'm an IP lawyer. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I think it depends vastly on what um, industry you're in. I mean, there are certain, you know, biotech, for example, is very patent dependent. And, you know, industrial uh, material science companies are probably very patent dependent. I, I think software companies tend not to file any patents. Um, so, you yeah, know, trademarks and copyrights generally are much less expensive to, to file. Uh, but that's a whole separate kind of body law that's pretty specialized. Sounds like you could probably hire her, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I was going to say software matches software yeah. are yeah. patentable. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a, yeah, people think they're not, but they are. Well, you mentioned you could do it online scan copy, but if somebody is in India developing the code, so governing law should be Indian governing law or U.S. governing law? I think people usually just use the U.S. on a lot of these things. It's just the same form that people will sign all over the world, and that's where the you know that's where the, the purchaser is. I think most companies don't tailor it for every specific jurisdiction. That works. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Even if the buyer was say Chinese, you can, yeah. sorry, you can go to the mask. Uh, this question is a follow-up. Dave, you were talking about how there's the strategic buyers, there's um, then also technology buyers and in the case of a strategic you're saying well you know it's a perf when it's a perfect fit right that's golden and it's doubles our revenue per region or whatever um, so what in your role what did you use to value to to decide what to purchase that for I mean there's there's EBITDA right but then there's the what is the strategic value so what were some of the factors that you considered in determining, especially if you were in a competitive situation, what you would actually spend for a business. And evaluation, I, I say <laughs> it's, a, it's an art, not a science. Um, yeah, I mean, so a couple kinds of things we, we take a look at. Uh, so for say just a technology acquisition um, where it's hard to really value, what we would compare is what, it was, what does it cost us internally to build and yeah, build versus buy, and then obviously there's some premium time to market, you know, and so there, there, you know if there was a huge delta, it probably would be something that we're not interested in buying, um, you know. And I don't know. So occasionally there'll be like you can do rules of thumb and say half a million per engineer, you know, and stuff like that. That that may vary uh, over time. And you can look at um, precedent acquisitions uh, and what was paid, you know, what did Salesforce pay for this that didn't have any revenue, you know, roughly, uh, th those are types of things. I think, um, so those, those are kind of hard. The, for most of our acquisitions that had revenue, most of them didn't have EBITDA, most of them were losing money. Um, so we would typically look at revenue multiples mm -hmm. and we'd compare them to, you know, revenue multiples, uh, what were the deals done in similar space, recent M&A deals, and what were the revenue multiples? And that's, you know, that's what you try to at least um, anchor everybody on. Um, and so you use top line. Top line, yeah, and yeah, because most of these things don't uh, don't have. Heck, a lot of these public companies don't necessarily have EBITDA. So private private equity is a different private equity buyers. That's a different piece, but. Because uh, they will be most likely looking at EBITDA, um, but I think of the 17 deals I th that were done during my tenure, maybe two were profitable. So all the rest were losing money. Um, so you know, so it's it's revenue multiples, and then you, know, you try to anchor people, and then uh, look at the end of the day, if they're multiple buyers, then things get wacky and stuff gets thrown out, right? So you know, we would always. You know, we'd have a sense. We try to anchor everybody 
look, this is what we're willing to pay, discipline, you know, we've got market facts to, to back that up, but the reality is if there are multiple parties and someone really wants it, particularly if it's a large uh, strategic buyer, I mean, all bets are off. So um, then that's what you ideally want is to have multiple parties in there. Right. So what was your multiple on the revenues then? What was the range? Well, so again, it would, it would vary. So for a perpetual on-premise software business, it was three to four three to five times, and again, it depends on growth rate, you know, um, for subscription, high growth, you know, five to seven, um, you know, kind of rules of thumb. Have we paid more? Yeah. Have we paid less? Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, you can look at, you know, if you're looking at a cloud business, look at what is Salesforce trading at, right? I mean, that gives you kind of at least a starting point, and, and maybe your growth rate's higher, and um, but that has more scale, and, you know, um, the, the toughest would be when a company would come to us and they were growing slower than we were and want to get a multiple that was higher than we were. It was a hard argument. So unless there are multiple parties in that, I can't con go convince my board to, to yeah, should pay a company that's in our space that's growing slower than we are a higher multiple. So, so this question is to Tammy. <clears throat> Thank you for your insight on your comments about it's better to distribute, uh, you know, across investors in terms of their power. I just wanted to get a little bit more insight to that because one of the things that I was thinking about is, if there's if you distribute too much, then how do you actually put the structure together um, so that you 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 know you want if there's a disagreement, what is the structure to make a decision at any point? I mean, w even with that, you can argue that there's additional people on the board of directors and so forth, so decision will be made one way or the other. But with that argument, then, if there's dominant one, then you can also argue the other way that other people could actually override them as well. So again, I just wanted to get more insight on, on your comments about the distributing the power is, is healthy. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess. Um there's sort of a, a formal structural answer, uh, and then there's kind of the the relationship sort of atmospheric piece of it. So the formal structural answer is that you know you'll have a board of X number of people, and and by virtue of the various agreements that are part of the financing documents that get signed, uh, the the allocation of those board seats will be made. So if you have two investors and you're an early stage company, typically investor A gets one board seat, investor B gets a board seat, founder gets a board seat. Maybe that founder slash CEO, presumably, and that and that you start with a small three-member board, and then you do another round of financing. And depending if you have a new investor come in, you maybe have to go to a board of five, and then the third guy gets a board seat. Or depending on how much people invest, you sort of rejigger the board at that point. Um, on the shareholder side, same thing. These legal agreements will divvy up um, or, or or dictate essentially uh, voting rights over significant material decisions, which include future financings, sale of the company, and frequently for an early stage company, a lot of other things. You you know you can't take on more than a nominal amount of debt, and they'll try to sort of exert a lot of control. There's a threshold, a percentage of the shares that's required for a vote to approve these enumerated matters, and that's where that gets set. And then, you know, just it's just a matter of math. How, you know, depending on how much money people put in, they own that percentage of the preferred shares, which are the shares that the investors buy. And then the threshold, of the voting threshold that's set in the documents dictates the vote required to approve something. The, the flip side of which, of course, is you know who can veto, who can block something effectively. So usually it, it, it's, a, it's a complete function of who put how much money in that dictates the, both the board and the shareholder approval rights or blocking rights. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a sort of structural matter, that's where that gets set. Um, uh, you know, if you have two relatively equal initial investors, you, you know, typically the voting right gets set so that you need both of them to get, I mean, it depends, but that, that to me is kind of ideal. So they both have to be on the same page to get something done and nobody can sort of hold something up necessarily. But the, the atmospherics, I think, are almost more important, which is if you have two investors, and I think Dave alluded to this earlier, and, and, and you know sometimes investors, they hate each other. They just hate each other. Some of these firms absolutely hate each other, and the reasons go back, I don't know, centuries or something, but they do. Um, and 
you know, having them uh, to get co-invested on a, in a company and sitting on a board together is just toxic. I mean, it's just, it's like Washington. I mean, it's just gridlock. You mm -hmm. can't get anything yeah. done and everybody's yeah. obstructionist just because for the sake of being obstructionist and the poor company gets caught in the middle of all this mess. And, um, and um, so if you, if you can have two investors who uh, have a functional relationship, I, what happens, I think, is people influence each other's viewpoints just by dialogue and discussion and debate. And that's where you can really, I think, you know, steer outcomes one way or another before you have to actually, you know, rely on the formal vote. You, you know, if you're relying on the formal vote and, and holding your breath to see how it comes out, that's not a good situation. So I think that's sort of more my perspective is if you can have a couple of people around the table who, and you don't want them to necessarily agree on everything. I mean, that's also my view. I mean, the diversity of viewpoint is a healthy thing. Um, and hopefully they respect the management team enough to give equal weight or certainly give the management team a voice. Um, that's where I think the health comes in and, and or unfortunately sometimes the total dysfunction. And just to just add that a little bit, you know, when you have a lot of investors, on the one hand, it's actually not bad because frequently nobody is invested enough to actually negotiate the documents. So people will frequently just sign what you send them, and they're not going to have a lot of rights by contract. They also may not do a lot of diligence, so it's much of a less you know, less painful process. But on the other hand, that means you have less people who are invested in the company. You know, from at a higher level, you will probably not have as well a functioning board. You won't have the discipline of having gone through a thorough diligence process, and so that may be more problematic later. It may also be hard, even if people don't have contractual blocking rights. You know, for things that you do need shareholder approval on, selling the company, approving an old class of shares, and amending your charter, it's harder to do if you've got such diffuse control that now you've got to track all these people down to get to a simple majority. So there's usually a healthy mix between not giving any single investor control and having too many investors that just can become unwieldy. And so having a few investors, you know, has some of those advantages. They will, they'll be invested enough that they'll put money in due diligence. They may negotiate the contracts and have some restrictions you may not want to part with, but you'll also probably have a better board as well because you've got people who are really invested in the business, um, you know, who are looking out for their investment as well. Yeah, and the other, the other thing is that then they'll spend time with you, I mean, good quality time. Hopefully, uh, you know they'll help. A lot of times, the percentage of ownership is is ultimately becomes a proxy for how much time any of these investors uh, are going to spend um, helping you recruit, for example. I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that investors, that's one of the biggest um, pieces of firepower a, a venture firm brings to the table is helping with recruiting. They can reach into networks that, you know, none of you alone could possibly tap. Probably all of you together couldn't tap. And, and, uh, and if they have, they have to have enough skin in the game to want to spend time uh, helping you, and, and whether it's recruiting or, you know, thinking about strategy or offering up their internal resources to help. Um, so it is, it's a delicate balance, but um, not too much, not too little. This question is for Tammy. I've seen this situation come up. You said that you should avoid fire sales. And so if you are running out of, out of funding, how do you avoid a fire sale? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm happy to answer, g give you my perspective, and uh, these guys can, I'm sure, certainly weigh in with more war stories than I have. Um, so, yeah, that's tough. Um, and that's, again, where you ideally have, you know, investors slash board members who are supportive and are understand what you're trying to do and have been getting regular updates so there are no surprises. Um, I mean, the, the, this, another very sad and thing, and it's the worst thing that can happen to a company, is to be surprised when... You know, they think they're going to walk into a board meeting and talk about the next round of financing, and all of a sudden everybody says we're done. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you, I guess I think you want to start thinking about raising money when you have about a year of cash left. And, and that depends. When you're an early-stage company, sometimes your first round of financing is only intended to get you four or six months or some proof of concept or, or something. But as a general matter, once you're sort of up and running, you, you really want to be thinking about where your next cash is coming from while you still have 12 months of cash. And you do not want to be without options when you have six months of cash, um, as a general rule, is what I would say. And the closer you're getting to being out of cash, the more likely you are to probably find yourself in, um, in you know, kind of an, a, a not orderly sales process. And that tends to be the fire sale situation. I mean, time, time is definitely kind of not your friend if you don't have that much of it left. And so planning ahead is always very important, um, you know, because things always take longer than you think. It takes longer to sell the company. It takes longer to raise capital. And so if you've got two months of cash left, then you think, gee, we're going to 
we should sell the company. We want to get it done in two weeks. That's not going to happen. So the more time you have, the better. Um, you now, we sometimes see happen is that you know the buyers know that and they'll smell blood and they'll start turning the screws. That if it does become too aggressive and they hit you too hard on price and other terms, sometimes investors do put some additional money in because um, I think they know there's going to be an exit, but that at least gives the company some breathing room to negotiate a better sale. But you know, you're taking a lot of risk of letting yourself get to that point. Um, so you're always better off, you know, preparing and acting well in advance of that. Yeah, I was, and the other thing that happens sometimes in those bridge scenarios where you've got your current investors bridging you to a sale is uh, the bridge is extended on fairly uh, painful terms. They're going to want some kind of sweetener. So it's not just uh, I'm giving you money and I want my money plus interest back. It's probably I'm giving you some money and I want two or three X of that as part of the sale proceeds coming to me first. Yeah, it's not a good situation to be in. Yeah. yeah, I would just echo plan ahead. I think a year, I think that's a that's great advice. At least, you know, a year out, start knowing what are, you know, okay, when do we run out and are we likely to get back in again? It takes time to sell a company. I mean, I, you know, I can, we tended to move quicker than others, but some of these larger organizations, they're looking at multiple deals, they've got multiple priorities, and you got to allow yourself time. And I can tell you as a buyer, as soon as we smell blood in the water and we know the company's going to hit a wall, you just wait. There's no, there's, you know, there's no need. And so um, I had... Yeah, and one other thing I'd say about that is just, you know, cultivate your relationships as time goes on. So <clears throat> you're not having your first meeting with a banker and your first meeting with a lawyer when you're 10 months of cash or 12 months of cash. You actually have had maybe multiple conversations already. And so, you know, they're in, those, those folks, those professionals are in position to, to move fairly quickly because even though a year is still a lot of time, it actually, because things do take longer, you know, again, if, if you have an extended process, by the time, you know, you've run that process again, a year is now six months, mm -hmm. and buyers start to start thinking about those issues. Mm -hmm. So basically, you want to stay like a year ahead of the fire yeah, and you sale, want, and you want to notify everybody. And you, and you want to be in touch with your board and really have your pulse on that positioning, and, and maybe have the kind of dialogue with your board is just like, where you know, where where is this going, so that, you know, if you have to ask the tough question as opposed to them showing up at the board meeting with the tough answer, say, you know, like, I've been thinking about, you know, maybe should we be thinking about running a, you know, a process? <clears throat> is this is this the time? And get, you know, get the feedback. It's better to to know than not to know. Thank you. Um, hi. Quick question about um, sale. Um, in case there is a majority uh, investor who, whose fund is coming to maturity and he wants an exit, can he uh, expedite the exit by meaning raise for a second for another new round or actually expedite the sale? And if so, how does this happen? And if you had some cases like this? Well, I think a lot of it depends on what their rights are um, and how much stock they hold. But if they own a lot or if they have, you know, significant rights, they would just try to force the company to sell. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of funds actually have provisions that don't allow kind of fund two to buy an investment from fund one. So the second fund may not necessarily kind of relieve the pressure on the first fund. Um, I think one of the things you can do, though, as a founder, if you don't want to sell, is try to kind of work cooperatively with your board maybe either find a you know, secondary investor to buy out the first fund if other people don't want to sell, or to at least kind of steer things towards a sale where you know, you're going to stay in control, maybe it's sale to a private equity sponsor where you still have operational control of the business, as opposed to a public company where you may get integrated and may have less of a role. So a lot of that's trying to balance some of those interests and work as a partner with your investor. Um, but you know, a lot of it really depends on how much rights they have. If they have 10% of the stock and no rights under the agreement, there's not much they can do, but you know, you're if it's if they have a much larger percentage, they'll, they'll be able to put a lot more pressure on you to, 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 to lead towards an exit. I feel like this has gotten depressing. <laughs> Are you all depressed? You shouldn't be depressed. All right. So I'd like to pose a hypothetical scenario of a company. Um, let's say the company had a great product. They have a really solid team. 
but they're missing key leadership because they're running on a really lean schedule. They're getting a lot of revenue, they're growing, but they can't afford the other leadership at the moment because they have a trajectory that they want to meet to be able to be sold in the first place. What types of investment firms or teams would be interested in that type of a company? And then if they were interested, how would they potentially work with them to bring them into their company or team? I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I mean, if <clears throat> there are a lot of executives out there that if you have a company that's growing nicely, you know, would probably be attracted by equity as opposed to cash to, to you know, that, that is very valuable to a company of, of that stage. Um, and again, I mean, if, you know, growth, growth is often king. I mean, if you have a company that's showing, you know, <clears throat> let's call it contribution margin positive growth. People are buyers are attracted by that. I mean, I think you've heard some of that tonight. I mean, people people like those types of metrics, and I'm I'm sure that um, you know you could probably also find executive talent that would be attracted by that, and you know, maybe disproportionately towards equity. A lot of the venture firms also have. Um cultivated this cadre of people they get called different things at different venture firms but most of them I think call them operating partners and they're people whose salaries it's the role I most recently had are actually paid by the venture firm and they kind of almost loan them out to the portfolio companies on a temporary basis to fill some gap they're typically um, uh, CEOs or sometimes CFOs or other senior executives who are just kind of between jobs they've done they've just had an exit they want to take some time off before they dive back into another company um, and the, the venture firms will make those people available to you to help fill certain skill set or knowledge or you know just personnel gaps and that's free to you and you should absolutely take advantage of that if that's available again though they're not going to do that unless they have they have to have enough of a stake and skin in the game to do it but it's a great resource if it's available Thank you. What are the investors' responsibilities, if at all there are any? Um, what are the investors' responsibilities? Is it his responsibility to put the money and then let the management run the company, or does he have additional responsibilities? Or can I expect an investor to hold some accountability? Or in other way, when I am investing in another company, what can that company expect out of me, apart from the money that I'm putting? Well, I think usually, at least under the contracts, there's usually no real responsibilities of the investor. Um, you know, they put money in. Um, but a lot of that's kind of for you diligence in your investors. I mean, a lot of investors, like Tammy mentioned, bring to the table a lot more than just money. And it's really more a question of you as the kind of founder to make the most of that and really kind of leverage your investors so it isn't just cash. But they certainly are not going to have an obligation to put more money in later, um, and they don't necessarily have an obligation to spend time on the company. That's really more your responsibility um, in terms of making sure that they're interested. And a lot of that's how you manage your board, how you act with your investors, are you giving them information, um, doing what you're, you know, complying with your obligations as founder as company under the agreements, um, and having that constructive relationship with the investors so they stay interested. If they have a board seat, then technically they have a fiduciary duty under Delaware law to you know, act in the best interest of the company and show up and be engaged and pay attention to what's going on. Of course, on. they can always resign if they if things get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they do do that. Yeah. Um, the challenge is coming now when the people are located all over the world. Different directors are in different countries. So, um, so is it okay to have a telephonic board meeting? Or Sure. Video in, in, in most in most countries, yes, I did just learn last week we're doing a deal for an Indian company that's raising venture capital and under Indian law. You actually need to both be able to see and hear people, so you can't have a telephonic meeting. It's got to be in person or by video, um, in the, which I just learned. But in the U.S. and a lot of other places, telephonic is fine as long as everyone can be heard. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So unless you. you're an Indian corporation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, well, let's hear it for a panel.